Chapter 25 of A Treasury of Heroes and Heroines. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Treasury of Heroes and Heroines by Clayton Edwards. Chapter 25 Florence Nightingale. The Red Cross nurse has become a heroic figure in the world today and has saved lives by hundreds of thousands in every quarter of the globe. She has labored under fire on the battlefield and in the reek of pestilence in the rear. Her form is as familiar in war as that of the soldier, and her name betokens every charity and kindness. But of all the heroic women who ever bore their healing art into the dark places and black hours of history, no name stands out with the luster of Florence Nightingale. She was born in 1822 in the city of Florence in Italy, and was named after the place where she first drew breath. Her father was William Nightingale, an English gentleman, and her elder sister, Parthenope, also took her name from the place where she was born, for Parthenope is the ancient term for Naples. The Nightingale family did not remain long in Italy, and soon after the birth of his youngest child, William Nightingale, with his wife and two little daughters, returned to England where the two girls spent their childhood in a rambling old house in Derbyshire, with many traditions and stories attached to it. Here Florence conceived a love for nursing, and used to tend sick animals in the neighborhood, and when she grew older, to sit up with and cheer the sick among the cottagers. There were not many people, even among those who were far older than herself, who could minister to the sick with her kindness and skill, and her fame soon was general through the neighborhood. Poor men used to come hat in hand to the old house, requesting that Miss Florence spend a few hours with a sick wife or a young mother, and the Nightingales were kind enough and sensible enough to allow their daughter to do the work for which she had so evident an inclination. There were no trained nurses in those days, and the general business of nursing as a profession was considered almost disreputable. Sick people were expected to be cared for by their relatives. Hospitals were inefficient and badly run, and the comforts of the modern sick room were unknown. As Florence grew older, she thought a great deal about these things, and finally decided that she would do something which at that time was regarded almost as strange as if she had declared her intention of visiting the North Pole. She said she was going to become a professional trained nurse, and went abroad to study nursing on the continent, which was far ahead of England in such matters. In a European hospital that was more in accord with the standards we know today, and where comfort, skill, and cleanliness went hand in hand, Florence Nightingale nursed the sick and acquired a mastery of the profession as it was then understood. It was so unusual for a woman of refinement to enter such a calling that she had become known in many places simply because she had decided to become a nurse, and after she returned to England she was at once offered the position of superintendent at a home for sick governesses in London. This home, like many another benevolent institution in those times, was badly administered. As it constantly showed a deficit, its friends had become discouraged in supporting it, and the subscriptions on which it lived had been falling off. The ladies who were compelled to remain there did not receive the care that they should have had, and were unhappy and dispirited. This was the state of affairs when Florence Nightingale became the superintendent of the home. In a very short time, the home was completely changed. Miss Nightingale had personally visited the former subscribers and secured once more their help and patronage. She had changed the system on which the home had been run to such an extent that it served as a model for institutions of its kind, and where the unfortunate women that lived there had been on the verge of actual physical suffering, they were now well cared for and contented. Then war broke out between England, France, and Turkey on the one side, and Russia on the other, a war that was brought about, among other reasons, by the desire of the Russian Tsar to seize and hold the port of Constantinople. Great Britain and France supported the Turks, and active fighting commenced. 
the theater of war soon shifted to the crimean peninsula where the british and french laid siege to the town of sebastopol which was russia's most important fortress and chief base of supplies before the walls of sebastopol there took place severe fighting which continued until bitter winter rendered further campaigning impossible while the war was going on thousands of sick and wounded british soldiers were pouring into the base hospitals at scutari where no provision for their care had been made with the constant flood of wounded men and men who were dying of dysentery and cholera with no medical supplies and little food with no nurses and only a few doctors the condition of the british wounded soon became terrible beyond description as there were no field dressing stations they had to be carried for days with their wounds undressed before they reached the hospital and when they arrived it was often some time before the harassed doctors could care for them they were brought in with their uniforms covered with filth and blood and were laid in long rows on the floors of the hospital where few cots were to be found vermin crawled over the floors over the walls and over the bodies of the helpless men rats gnawed the fingers of the wounded who were too weak to drive them away there were no conveniences of any kind and many men died of exhaustion because no food adequate for the sick could be prepared all the food we are told consisted of beef and vegetables boiled together in one huge cauldron into which new supplies were thrown indiscriminately as fast as they were delivered the bread was mouldy and the beef too tough even for well men to eat owing to the efforts of a war correspondent of the london times the people at home were soon informed of the state of affairs in the crimea and gifts and supplies poured in profusely but owing to the inefficiency and red tape of the war department the supplies were not delivered but lay rotting in warehouses and in the holds of vessels while men died for the want of them on one occasion we are told a consignment of shoes for the soldiers turned out to be in women's sizes improper inspections resulted in high profits for the army contractors made uniforms out of shoddy and leather accoutrements from paper filled the cores of hay bales with kale stocks and cheated the government right and left without forbearance or conscience then the newspapers began calling for english women to go to the crimea and care for the sick and florence nightingale heard the call she wrote a letter to sidney herbert who was minister of war volunteering to organize a body of nurses and go out to the crimea to care for the wounded right then a curious thing happened the war department had already decided that miss nightingale was the one person who could take charge of the reorganization of the hospitals in the crimea and had written a letter requesting her services offer and request crossed each other in the mails on the following day her appointment was officially announced and she was overwhelmed with proffers of assistance from all sides a large number of patriotic women volunteered to aid her but only a very few possessed the necessary qualifications for such a task of all that offered to go miss nightingale was only able to accept thirty that she considered would be capable of performing the severe tasks that lay ahead for she knew only too well the grim welcome she would receive at the crimea without farewells quietly and at night seen off only by a few intimate relatives the little group of nurses started on their mission the first one where women were to care for the soldiers who had fallen in war they crossed the english channel and arrived at boulogne in france on the following morning where they were given a rousing greeting by the voluble french fishwives who had heard of their mission and who crowded around them to get sight of the angels of mercy from there they made their way to the seat of the war and miss nightingale looked for the first time on the hospital where she was so soon to acquire immortal fame it may well be thought that her heart sank when she saw the enormity of the task that lay before her for she had been sent to bring order from chaos plenty from want comfort from torture and cleanliness from wholesale filth she had to contend not only with these awful conditions but with the dislike and distrust of the medical officers with whom she was to work who resented the fact that a woman had been sent out to reorganize what they considered a part of their department and who doubted because she was a woman that she would be capable of doing so efficiently and when she arrived 
there was no time to spend in preliminary planning for active fighting had been going on at the front and the wounded from recent battles were pouring in adding to the confusion that already existed they were laid groaning in hallways and on the bare ground until such time as the doctors could look after them then florence nightingale hardly taking breath plunged into the task that awaited her and sent her nurses to the quarters where they were most needed with their own hands these brave english women scrubbed the reeking floors and supervised the work of the orderlies they visited the quartermasters and obtained the supplies that had been tied up through faulty administration and through army red tape and in a short time they had established a diet kitchen where several hundred sick and wounded men could have the food they required food that would save their lives the death rate we are told before this woman nurse and her little company arrived at the hospital was sixty per cent of all the cases that were treated there and after she had effected the changes that she saw were necessary the death rate was only one per cent a fact in itself that speaks more loudly than any words for her efficiency and her bravery at times this indomitable woman was on her feet for twenty hours out of the twenty-four supervising directing taking the last message of some dying soldier for his family feeding another who was too weak to feed himself the doctors who had been her opponents soon looked up to her and became her devoted friends and the men who had been through such terrible sufferings thought she was indeed an angel from heaven and as she passed down the long wards would furtively kiss her shadow as it fell across their blankets many a time she took charge of cases that had been given up by the doctors who turned their attention always to those whom they believed had a fighting chance for life and she nursed them back to life with a patience and a tenderness that the doctors could not spare from the ships and warehouses there commenced to appear the comforts that sick men demanded sheets and nightgowns socks and pillows in the place of the nauseous beef stew the wounded began to get broths and jellies should they die they were sure of a woman's hand and a kindly ministration at the last for florence nightingale had resolved that no man should die unattended in her hospital and the wonders she performed were heard of back in england where her name became national she had gone to scutari in eighteen fifty four in may eighteen fifty five she visited other hospitals that were nearer the seat of war and went into the trenches themselves before sebastopol one of her biographers tells us that when she entered the trenches she was warned by a sentinel to go no further because the enemy had the place under close watch and would certainly open fire when they beheld a group of people at that particular point my good young man replied miss nightingale more dead and wounded have passed through my hands than i hope you will ever see on the battlefield during the whole of your military career believe me i have no fear of death then she fell ill with crimean fever and through the army the news was received with more consternation than a severe defeat men broke down and cried like children when they heard that miss nightingale lay at the point of death and the commander-in-chief lord raglan rode through sleet and mud for hours to visit her personally she did not die however but recovered to take up again her duties as chief nurse and organizer when the war was ended miss nightingale remained at the crimea until the last soldiers were sent home and then and not till then she followed them after most of the men had left and only a few remained she still worked faithfully to serve them establishing reading huts and places of recreation such as the red cross and the y m c a established in france and belgium in the course of the world war some sixty years later as a matter of fact the work performed by miss nightingale was indirectly responsible for the birth of the red cross which was organized in switzerland some four years after she had finished her work at the crimea and certainly no name in the red cross in spite of the host of noble men and women who have served there has ever equaled the glory of her own she returned to england quietly as she had left although a british government placed a battleship at her service and she lived in england engaged in useful and philanthropic work for a great many years with a fund of about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars she founded the nightingale home for the proper training of nurses a fund that she could have doubled or trebled had she so desired or if the needs of the home had required it 
In the following years, she was frequently consulted on hospital organization in the armies, not only of Great Britain, but of continental nations as well. She died in 1910, one of the great figures among the heroines of history. End of chapter 25